Got our singing voices all warmed up. We got to see a baptism this morning. We got a great message coming for you guys. We're so glad you're here. Thank you so much for coming. Feel you lifting all the way 
We're glad everybody showed up tonight. We, we are in still in our sermon series, Tough Topics. We will be for a little bit because uh, it's a topical series. Uh, but a lot of them have to do with things that you're concerned about. This sermon series, uh, you can message me. We I just had more messages today, so many weeks into the sermon series of new things that uh, you guys would like us to cover. And so we're going to be continuing to develop those and add to the messages that we have in the, in the next coming weeks. And uh, we'll be putting some of those in. So we'll be doing this for a little while. And uh, we're just glad to do it mostly because of our vision and our purpose statement. The purpose statement is for the church to win, train, sin, win people to Christ, train each other up in the Lord, and be sent out. Because while there's a lot of different things that you're doing, the church is united. Uh, and, and so uh, we have to be uh, purpose-driven, um, not so much as in the book that came out 20, 30 years ago, but we have to be purpose-driven because Matthew 28, 19 tells us to be in the Great Commission. So that's why, that's why we make that statement. Our vision for you and your family is to serve your family and grow your ministry. It's one of the reasons that we focus on kids and teenagers in this church. It's one of the reasons that we try to have women's events and we have the coffee shop open during the week, even though it's really not a coffee shop. It's just our church extending its time through the week. Uh, it, it's why we do many of the things that we do. And that's so that your ministry can grow. And Tough Tops, one of those. And one of the things that you told us is you want to, remember I told you, if you don't like a sermon, it's your, it's somebody in your row's fault maybe, right? In times. People are always interested about end times. And so I try to put a little blurb out today about it uh, before this weekend. And people are concerned about the end times. And so they want to hear messages and Bible studies. And it's one of the things that we go over in my biblical worldview class. You get a big chart. In fact, we do have an end times chart with the verses um, uh, listed for every single thing that we teach at this church. It's a complete chart. It's the best chart I've ever seen, not just because we use it at this church. It's not my chart, but one of our good friends in ministry has uh, spent a long time on it and has created it over the years. We have a few of those out on the back table. We'll have more on Sunday morning if we run out tonight. So here's what I want to say before I start talking about the end times. We are an independent Christian church, a part of the restoration movement. And what that means is we are a back-to-the-Bible movement that focuses on unity. So if you have a different view than what I'm going to speak on tonight about, or th this weekend about end times, we still like you. We're still your friend. You don't have to agree with it to come to church here. You don't have to sign. We don't make you sign a waiver before you leave. That You have to be a free millennial dispensationalist, okay? So you're, if you don't know what that means, it's okay. By the end of the sermon, you might. But but you don't have to say it doesn't matter. We, we focus on um, things about salvation, that Jesus is Lord, uh, but we don't focus on side issues. Although they could be important to your faith and they could help your ministry, that's why we teach about them, they're not central to salvation, what you believe about them. So when we talk about things that are tough topics, some of them are, so they do have to do with your salvation. Your view on the end times, guess what? We'll all find out. Right, and so so we'll find out who's right and wrong, and then I'll tell you. See, I told you so. But anyway, we're going to start talking about it tonight. There's all kinds of views about end times. In 1988, there was a book that came out. Well, I guess it was before 88. 88 reasons that Jesus was coming back in 1988. Guess what? He didn't. Right? I mean, we we're past 1988. Then. Uh, there was another one. Well, that wasn't quite true. So 1992, right? There was another one that came out by that segment. Then, everybody remember Y2K? All computers were going to shut down. And, all you know, just, I, I, was, I was in a church that we were, it was in a staff meeting at the time in Topeka. They were like, what are we going to do uh, when, when the year 2000 hits and, and all the power grid shuts. And they were worried, some people, not everybody, but some people were worried about it. And if you weren't born then, then don't worry about it. But guess what? He didn't come back in the year 2000 or Y2K or anything like that. So then I think they did another one in 2009. I think the same guy sold books from 88, 92, and 2009. So for him, it was, it was a good ploy. But guess what? Jesus didn't come back. 
Some people a few years ago started learning as uh, the internet has grown and information has grown, people have found out the, about Jewish festivals, especially Christians. They start learning about the biblical festivals. They're not just Jewish, it's God's people. We can celebrate them. In fact, the Bible commands to celebrate them uh, because they celebrate God and what he did. We, can, we kind of think of them as Jewish festivals. They're really not. They're for God's people. <laughs> so one person... Uh, I'd kind of known, and it was it was one of uh, what Americans started calling a blood moon, and it really shouldn't be called a blood moon, but people were calling it a blood moon. It was one of the harvest moons, and it was at the beginning of a festival, and it was supposed to be a big deal, and it was the day of, and so this person, who I'll leave nameless because it's kind of embarrassing, came up to me. He's like, "Hey, man," it's like, "Yeah, you know about the blood moon." I was like, you mean the harvest moon that's coming up? Yeah, that could be it. And I was like, it was about eight hours ago in Jerusalem. It was like this look on his face. He had never thought about that. But you know where you're reading the Bible, it's the things that they're going to see in Israel. And if, the, if it says the whole world's going to see them, that the whole world's going to But it, guess what? The Bible wasn't written in the United States or in Nebraska. I know that's a shock to many of you. But when he saw the moon, it was 12 hours after they saw the moon in Israel. So he was already over, and it was a big shock to him, but I think, you know, it might come around someday. Anyway, I think Revelation, I think end times is one of the strongest, you might be surprised to hear this, but I think it's one of the strongest witnessing tools that we have. I think, first of all, um, the end times is powerful two ways. If you never see the end times, you'll still die. Big shocker. You don't know how much time you have less. The end times, for everyone that has studied the end times up till now, the end times for you is fixed. It's coming soon. Whether the end times uh, for the greater church and God's people comes, for you it will come. For me it will come. All right? But God puts some things in his scripture and he says some amazing things. Don't ever shy away. From Revelation, Isaiah, Matthew 24. Don't ever shy away. Look what the Bible has to say. In Revelation 1, 3, it says, Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of prophecy. Blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for their time is near. Why would the Bible say this? It, it, it's Blessed is the one who reads what? The book of Revelation, the, the, the things the relaying of God's word in the book of Revelation is a blessed thing. So don't ever shy away from it just because maybe you don't understand every word. And we'll help clear that up. The Lord wants us to know what the signs of the, signs of the time are. But why? Uh, you know, it kind of takes me to this idea of how many of us are procrastinators. You know, when you were in school, how many of you guys waited to the last minute? If something's coming up, you wait... Uh, in life, there are certain areas that we wait. And I think sometimes in God's people, that could really come back to bite us. I think people are always waiting to start their ministry. Well, I'm going to wait to really get serious with the Lord till after I'm out of school. I'm going to wait till after the kids are out of the house. I'm going to wait till after I retire. Pretty soon you've lived your whole life. No, the time is now. That's the point. When we look at God's word and what the Bible says about the word of God, Whatever situation you're in, the time is then. It's, it's now. I don't want my kids, certainly, to wait until they've passed up everybody they went to middle school and high school with to see those people baptized. You've seen uh, Pierce and, and, and so my children be baptized and baptize their friends. That's, what I, that's my desire. That's what I pray for because guess what? Uh, that doesn't change. And I remember when I first decided to go to Bible college, none of my friend group wanted me to go to Bible college. They wanted me to take scholarships to play in different schools and this and that. They did not want me to go to Bible college. Do that when you're older. I even had certain family members that said, come back to that when you're like done with sports. You're th over 30 or something like that. It's like, that's not really how it works, guys. And so <clears throat> God doesn't want you to live your life like this. And in Colossians 4, 5, it says this. Walk with wisdom towards outsiders making the best use of time. You know, you don't know how much time you have left and you can't buy more of it. So when you're talking about the end times, of course, that is 
the culmination of God and his people. But you have to be careful as a Christian how you spend your time. The Bible wants you to be wise with that. So how do we look at stuff when it comes to the end times? Well, there's lots of opinions. Lots of opinions. In fact, I spent a good part of the end of my Bible college writing papers about this and doing seminar classes on it uh, as I was learning uh, the different uh, nuances of Greek and Hebrew. And, and, and so uh, the first one tonight uh, we'll list is, are the dispensational premillennialists? And if you're like, well, I don't know what that... Uh, the millennial just means a thousand year. Okay, so this is just a set apart thousand years and, and these are the people um where well and, and then there's a couple of ideas among this but this this would be a literal that it's yet to come jesus will come we will meet god in the air in this scenario right and i heard somebody get online a famous um apologist who speaks at college campus he does a very good job arguing the ph philosophy of the existence of God, but not a Bible scholar. Those are two different things. He said, the word rapture is not in the Bible. I said, what? Yeah, I, me I messaged him online. Uh, I, the word rapture is Latin for caught up. The word caught up, that, people, that God's people will be caught up with him in the air, absolutely is in the Bible. That's like saying the word Jesus isn't in the Bible. It's Iusus in Greek or Yeshua in Hebrew, but because it went to Latin, it got a J, and because it's in English, and it's distinctive, it's Jesus and not even Joshua. But his name is Joshua, Yeshua, I use this in Greek. So do you want to walk around and say the word Jesus is in the Bible? That's ridiculous. <laughs> so, so the word caught up is absolutely in the Bible. And so dispensational pre premillennials say this is literally going to happen. You're going to be caught up in the air with the Lord. And then there's going to be a thousand-year reign of Christ, okay? And then eternity starts. That's all this means, really simple. Well, in this group, there's an argument. There always has to be in the church, you know, whether the church red or brown or look up, not here, but we have a gym floor, so that took care of that. But, but in some churches, you've got to argue about everything. Is Jesus going to become before the tribulation, during the tribulation, or after the tribulation? Well, we'll come back to that. <laughs> so then we just have regular premillennialists. Then we have amillennialists. And then we have postmillennialists. And this is just when, the, when is the thousand year reign? Amillennialism says we're somewhere in the thousand year reign. Really? Could you pick a thousand years from when Christ died till now when it seemed like Christ in the church? are better than the Garden of Eden, because this is the description of the millennial reign, and that people will live uh, longer than they did pre-flood, which was eight, nine hundred years. Is, is some place described there? No. In fact, everywhere in the world, uh, anytime we look, we see that millions of Christians are always killed for their faith. Even today, uh, there was... There, you know, if stats prove out right, there was 100 Christians killed today. Around the world, because they believe in Jesus, it's illegal to believe in Jesus in 52 countries today. And it's never been better than that. So when are you going to pick the thousand-year reign? Post-millennial, it's already all happened. It's all happened and you are just asleep. Okay. Now, if you believe those, let me just tell you, I wrote a thir uh, 13... 18-page paper defending all millennialism one time in college. Okay, so if you believe those, it's okay. But I think I think um, what what we would give you would be help you make sense of the world that we live in plus scripture. So we know if there's a tribulation, we know that there are some things that need to happen. To understand the end times, we're going to need to look at the words of Jesus. One of the most understandable. Uh, sections of scripture was spoken by Jesus in Matthew 24 verse 29 it's titled the coming of the son of man immediately after the tribulation in those days the sun will be darkened the moon will not give its light the stars will fall from heaven and the powers of heaven will be shaken when is that after the tribulation 
after the tribulation, uh, what happens in the book of Revelation, whether you want to study it or not, people smash terms together. So in the Bible, it says that the church will not experience the wrath of God, but it never does. It never says that we won't experience a tribulation. The church has been in tribulation since Jesus died on the cross. But the church will not experience the wrath of God. And the wrath of God is what comes after the tribulation. So we have that for you on a chart. It's okay. But Jesus had just told the disciples some things, and we need to know what those are because we live in current times, right? It's been a long time since Jesus ascended into heaven. It's been a long time since he told his disciples to write down Matthew chapter 24. It's been a long time since the apostle John was given the vision of heaven. A lot of times in churches they'll say, well, you know, back then they thought all this was going to happen because Jesus said that John would see these things come to pass before he died. And guess what? He did see them. He wrote the book of Revelation and then he died, right? He wrote the book of Revelation, stay with me, before he died. So we read what John wrote. He got a vision of heaven. He got the vision of the end times, and he wrote it down for us. And a lot of it uh, is similar to things that we read in the book of Isaiah and Daniel. It's actually pretty tremendous. All of the New Testament is a commentary on what's already been said in the Old Testament. So when we get to Matthew chapter 24, if you want to know the end times, you just study Matthew chapter 24. If Revelation confuses you or the book of Daniel confuses you, read Matthew 24. I think it helps us. But there are a couple of things that, that we are blessed by. So there's a couple of things that are yet to happen, and we get to read those in Scripture. Jesus had just told the disciples in the city that the temple would be torn down and not one stone would be left upon another, which means the temple that they are in, that they're saying, will be gone. It's going to be gone. And not one stone is going to lay upon the other. Um, and then Scripture tells us some other things. In 2 Thessalonians 2, 3 through 4, it says, Let no one deceive you in any way, for a day, uh, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first, and the man of lawlessness is revealed, and the son of destruction who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes a seat in what? The temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. Revelation 11, 1 through 2, talks about the two witnesses. Then I was given a measuring rod like a staff, and I was told, rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship there, but do not measure the court outside of the temple. Leave that out, for it is given over to the nations, and they will trample the holy city for 42 months. So a third temple and a treaty that's made by the beast, or what commonly is called in our day the Antichrist, which is not a real accurate term, but the Bible calls it the beast. In Daniel 9, 27, it says, And he shall make a strong covenant with many for one week. For half that week he shall put an end to the sacrifice and offering, And on the wing of abomination shall come ones who make desolate and decreed until the end is poured out on the desolator. So a lot of of that is like, okay, desolate and desolator and abomination of desolation. A lot of those terms are not familiar to us. It's okay. The point is, what's going to happen? There's a few things that have to happen. And one of those would be uh, that we need a third temple. Now, some people kind of argue that, and that's okay if you do, but we, we can see Some other things also have to happen in Revelation 13, 15 through 17. It said that he had a power to give life unto the image of the beast. The image of beast should both speak and cause that many would not worship. The image of beast should be killed. So this person is going to kill, this this beast is going to kill people who won't worship the image of the beast. And he caused all of them, both great, small, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand and or in their forehead, that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. So we see a global economic demand, a global currency, right? A third temple, a beast, a political figure that uh, 
fits this term, giborim, in the New Testament, all those things. Now, there's a Bible study that we do that goes along with those things, and like I said, we, have, we do have a chart. We'll have more of those on, on Sunday morning for you if we run out tonight. What, what I want to tell you is one of the greatest witnessing tool is certain things that we see today that we can attribute to the desire for evil people to do this. And now, it's not that people who will vote this way or do that, not, not that they know Revelation and know what's coming, but we do see kind of a groaning for this. We see uh, the Tower of Babel and Nimrod in the, in the Old Testament. We see the beast. The, the names given to both Nimrod and the beast are similar. Uh, right? It's, it's, the, it's the word gibor or giborim. And, 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 it, and in, the, in the Old Testament, Nimrod became one. And in the New Testament, the, the beast, he becomes this giborim. And so he becomes this evil entity given power by Satan. And we see that some things happen. And you can kind of see the push for that today. You can kind of see the push for, uh, you can see uh, the words like global citizen and, and, and things like this, and we can see the push towards uh, a one, maybe a, possibly pretty soon a one world monetary system. And, and so sometimes people get real nervous about this and they, and they, oh, you know, it might come. And so we have a lot of people who start uh, saying, you should watch about the end of times and here's, a, and, and here's when it's going to happen. And, and here's what I want to say. We need to, we kind of need to stop with that side of it. The shock and, and the scare tactics. We need to stop with that side of it because the personal responsibility to bring people to Christ has never changed. I know a lot of preachers who preached in times and screamed that it could happen any moment. It could happen any moment. It could happen any moment. You know why? Because every single Bible scholar has read the Bible in the history of mankind and they've wanted it to be able to happen in their lifetime. They wanted to walk out and Jesus to come like a thief of the night like lightning hits, like a blink of the eye, we'd be raised up the Lord. But it cannot just happen that way. God told us these are some things to look for in the very, very last days. What your Bible calls the 70th week of Daniel. But Bible scholars haven't always been content with that. And so a lot of people say, well, Jesus is going to come back. We're going to be caught up with the Lord on this date and this date. And I've simply just said, from my point of view, no. Nah, no, we're not. People were freaked out about Y2K. I didn't know whether my lights were going to shut off or not, so I asked my dad. He ran a power company where we lived. I said, Dad, what if all the lights turn off? He said, well, I'll go turn them back on. He goes, I only flip a switch. It goes right off the computer. He started laughing at me. So I went back to a church staff meeting and laughed at all of them, and they didn't laugh, but I thought it was funny. Some people, oh, what if Jesus comes back tomorrow? Said, Did you know about the harvest moon? Yeah, it's not going to happen. Well, how can you be so sure? Well, I don't know. The Bible tells me at least three things that got to happen that still haven't happened yet. And, and you got to be careful when you look at the Bible. A lot of people say, on the hand. Or, but the Bible says, in. There's just nuances to the language and the wording. And so I think it's responsible as the believer to do this. Read Revelation, Matthew chapter 24. L read the book of Daniel and Isaiah and go, guess what? My life is very important. I'm a child of the Most High God. I th this is why it's blessed if you read it. You are a child of the Most High God, and if you're not, hurry up and be baptized into Christ and start give your life to Him. And if you're a, a lukewarm Christian, you know there's seven letters at the beginning uh, of Revelation written to the seven churches. A lot of it's like, hey, stop messing around. You ever seen a really talented team play sports, and for the first half, they're kind of like, oh, I don't care if we win or lose. What's the coach do? Brings them over. Quit messing around. You're going to run until you throw up. You're going to be in trouble. You know, hey, stop it. And this is what God, you know, he provides us the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is our comfort. The word comfort is an old English term that means a lock turning a key. It's like a motivation. It's more like a coach that says, hey, quit screwing around. And, and, and so when it talks about the end times, be wise, the Bible says, with the time that you're given here on earth. Don't screw around. Don't live your life for the world. There's money, and there's sex, and there's this, and there's that, and there's, you know, all kinds of things you could be addicted to. The biblical writers like John, he says, say, don't do that. Don't do that. I got a vision from heaven. Here's what God has to say to you, church. 
stop doing, stop being lukewarm. God doesn't want that. So what do we do when we look at the end time stuff? Whatever your view is, if everything I've said to you is different than what you think, it's okay because you'll find out you're wrong and I'm right. It's all right. You'll come around. <laughs> no, here's the point. You don't know how much time you have. Now, maybe the end times will happen in the next several years. Maybe it won't happen for a long time. But I'll bet you can guess how much time you have. Less than 50, less than 40. Some of you, less than that. Who knows? Somebody who thinks they have a long time walks out and pulls out on a driveway. You're done. Get a bad health report. Two months later, you're not here anymore. I know lots of people that studied end times with their whole life. And guess where they are? With the Lord in heaven. Guess when their end times was? Quicker than they thought. That's okay for the believer. That's our hope in Christ. Guess what? We don't know that. That's why the Bible tells us, hey, hey, Christian, you live different than the world. Be wise with your time. Guess what? Grow your ministry. Win people to Christ. Baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Go to the world and preach the gospel. Heck, right where you live. How come people around you aren't coming to Christ? The Bible, biblical writers would say this, stop messing around. The end is near for you and the people that can hear your voice. The end is near. It's been thousands of years since Jesus ascended into heaven, but the people around you don't have that long. And, and one of the unique things about this is the Bible says, blessed is the per person who hears the pro Why? Because it wakes us up. It lets us look around and say, hey, not all the world is, is, is loving Jesus. Some of the world is evil. And, and some of it just groans to be more evil. Some of it is pushing to be more evil. And I think we can see that with current day uh, political figures and people in the entertainment industry and, and people that are on television, we can see the push and the yearning not towards Jesus, no. And that's okay because God told us that's the way it's going to be. But that you, a son and daughter of the Most High God, should be wise with your time and your life should be about the stuff that your Father in Heaven is about. That's what this is all about. That's why God wants us to know about the end times. It's why he wants you to be wise with your time. It's why he wants you to read this book and be blessed by it. So you'll care about the things that the Father in heaven cares about. Hey, as we go to communion to honor the Lord with the sacrifice of his body and blood, let's think about some people who don't know Jesus. It's really what our church is about anyway, right? It's why we exist. It's why we have a vision for the city and winning people to Christ. How about you? You know people that don't know Jesus. How about you be blessed by the words of this book? How about your heart be stirred? How about you start understanding what God understands? How about you read the vision of John, Isaiah, Daniel? How about you look at Paul in, in, in the book of Thessalonians and you go, you know what? And when we go to communion, we lay it down at Christ. Lay our sins down. Listen, God's taking care of those. But we start praying for the people in our life that don't know Jesus. And instead of going home and living selfishly, now we live our life so that they might know who he is. I think whatever you're dealing with when it comes to the Lord, you need to deal with that in your chair. You need to give that to God. But when you commit to Jesus, then get up and go to communion. And the prayer that you have to say is about building God's kingdom. Thank you, Jesus, that you died on the cross. And here are the people that I want you to help me, work through me to help get saved, Lord. This is the prayer of the believer. This is why we remember Jesus. This is why communion is the highlight of our week, to come together and to remember what Jesus did on the cross. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word about end times. It's absolutely incredible. Lord, there's deep Bible study that goes into this. And, and at the end of the day, what you want us to do is care. You want us to stop living for the worthless, temporary things of the world. 
So, Lord, I pray for a congregation who would care about the people in their lives, about their children, about the friends that they have, about the people that they can invite, about the people that they can serve. Give them a chance to speak of you. Give them a chance to let their light shine like a city on a hill. Lord, you've told us some things that were going to happen. They may happen in our lifetime or not. Only you know. But, Lord, I pray this weekend for a congregation of people that will love you so much that our business will become yours. In Jesus' name, amen. coming out today. We love seeing all of you here in such big numbers. It is incredible to see you just showing up. Uh, incredible to see the encouragement for the baptisms. Thank you so much. If you're new, stop at the back table and grab a coffee mug. We'd love for you to grab that. Uh, don't forget this Wednesday, we have middle school youth group and Sydney is going to shave that ridiculous beard on his face, because we're going to get over 55 kids. We're going for 70 this week, 70 kids. So all of you, bring your kids, bring their friends, bring their dogs, bring their dog's friends. I'm done talking. Don't ask 
actually bring your dog. 